aboard the Athletics Can't Wait Jets podcast, your nonstop shop for all things Jets. Now here are your hosts, Tim McMaster and Connor Hughes. Listen safely. Can't wait. Hey, YouTube viewers, check out our sponsors in the description below the video. A lot of great companies there, so check it out. Three rounds down, four to go in the NFL draft, but the bulk of the Jets work is done. After a big first round with three premier talents taken, the Jets go all offense with two picks on Friday. We're breaking it down. Tim McMaster here with a very tired Connor <laughs> Hughes. He's been up till, I think, 4 a.m. on thir- Friday morning and then 1, 2 a.m. this morning. But he is back at it this morning to bring us this information. Uh, if you're checking us out on YouTube, uh, you know, subscribe, give us the thumbs up, give us a far- five-star rating if you're on uh, Apple or anywhere else. All right, Connor, let's dig right into it. They go running back, they go tight end, tight end position of need, running back, less position of need, but we've talked about the fact that they like to have multiple running backs. But let's start there. 36th pick, uh, they deal a fifth round pick to move up two spots to get who pretty much everybody, I think, had rated as the number one back in this draft in Brees Hall, the running back out of Iowa State. Um, the numbers on this kid from from college are oh, insane. Kind of, yeah, kind of ridiculous. Yeah, three years he had just under four thousand yards rushing, fifty touchdowns, uh, eight hundred touches. He carried it a ton. Scored a touchdown in twenty four straight games. Um, really brought Iowa State to a new level of success for that program. Uh, they got to a Fiesta Bowl. Um, so all of that is one thing. That's college. What did the Jets like about Brees Hall? Well, I, I, I'll tell you what, man, just kind of big picture. I was, I was actually talking with somebody over there last night about this on my way home from the facility. And I said, I was like, man, you know, I've covered this team for a while, but I don't think I can ever recall there being an offense with this much potential. And what I mean by this much potential is that the Jets have had playmakers before, right? Like you can go back to even uh, in, in more recent memory when it was Braylon Edwards and Santonio Holmes, you know, but The one thing that you could always say throughout pretty much every stretch of Jets football, specifically when it comes to the offensive side, and I know this more more recently, you know, in 2014 when I really started covering them, is that there was always a but on offense, right? You know what I mean? Like, even if you think about that 2015 offense that was so prolific with with Eric Decker and Brandon Marshall, it was like, well, but they don't have a tight end because they really didn't have a tight end. You know, they, they had a decent one-two punch at running back, but they had the great receivers. They had a quarterback who played out of his mind and fits, but they never really had the tight end, and they never really had that dynamite offensive line. They had guys on kind of the last legs of their career, but it wasn't really all that great of a line. Go back to the San Antonio Holmes thing. It's kind of the same thing. There were they were missing pieces on that offense. You know, they, they had this. They didn't have that. I was driving home, and like I said, it kind of sparked the the – the, the, the interest in, in texting this one out there, but like, this is the first time that I can truly remember in my tenure of, of watching the jets from afar, you know, before I started covering them. And then intently, obviously when I started covering them that this offense top to bottom just has the potential to be freaking unreal. You know, like, I mean, think about it and we're going to talk specifically about Brees Hall in a minute here, but that running back duo, Mike Carter is now your second best running back on the roster. Like Mike Carter was a guy that fantasy football people loved. And I know the Jets were always trying to pair him with someone. And I always thought the Jets were going to pair him with someone, which we talked about a little bit yesterday. But in the pairing with Michael Carter, I never thought that they would get somebody better than Michael Carter. I thought they would draft like somebody in the fifth round or the sixth round or the seventh round that was going to fit that um, Kyle Shanahan type role. Just find someone with the skill set, throw him in there. We know our offensive line will lead to him being production. When they went out there and got Brees Hall, this is going to be, I mean, this is going to be like a 60-40 split in favor of Bryce Hall, a 55-45 split in favor of Bryce Hall. because Or Bryce Hall, this is going to be such Bryce, a hell yeah. covering this team I with Mike, Hall, Mike <laughs> Carter, Mike Carter, Brees Hall, Bryce Hall, Zach Wilson, Garrett Wilson. Like, I'm just, I, this is going to be so bad. But you now have a running back in Brees Hall who is significantly better than, um, oh, sorry, Tim. All right, let me make sure my settings are right here. I just saw that. Yeah, you're right. Here we go. Boom. Instantly better. Oh, you sound so much better. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I had the uh, I had the wrong um wrong mic on. We're gonna chalk that one up, but uh, chalk that one up to literally having absolutely no sleep over the last few days. <laughs> you're probably laughing at me because it's draft nights every night for you having a newborn, but for me, I'm not I'm <laughs> this stuff. I'm still pampered. Um 
But you look at this offense, right? Specifically running back. You had a decent situation with Mike Carter, right? Mike Carter was was the decent situation. It was it was a good punch. You form with somebody else. That's a good one-two punch. You go out in the draft, and you get a guy in Brees Hall who now is a better player, a significantly better player than Mike Carter, where Mike Carter is now the two in the one-two punch, which I never thought was going to happen again. I thought undrafted free agent, seventh-round pick, maybe sixth, maybe fifth, maybe fourth round, the Jets get a running back that they pair with Mike Carter. But to go out there and get Brees Hall, it's like, holy cow. You know, and then you go from that, though, it's not just the running game. It's not like the Jets are just ground and pound because then you flip over to the receivers and you've got Corey Davis and you've got Elijah Moore and you've got Garrett Wilson and you've got Braxton Berrios. That's a one, two, three elite level top bunch with Braxton Berrios there to fill in if anything happens, because something happened to Corey Davis. Elijah Moore goes outside. Braxton Berrios goes to the slot. If something happens to Gary Wilson, Elijah Moore goes out there. He goes there to slot. If something happens to, to Elijah Moore and he gets hurt, then all of a sudden Braxton Berrios goes to the slot. So you got that. But then guess what? It's not just running back and it's not just receiver. Now you've got the tight ends too because you've got CJ, whom you signed in free agency. You got Conklin, who you signed in free agency. Now you signed or drafted Ruckert, who we'll get into in detail in a little bit. You've got the tight end package now. And then you also throw into the fact that since he took over as general manager in 2019, Joe Douglas has exhausted so many means to improve this offensive line. And I know we've talked ad nauseum about how there is legitimate concerns at the tackle position, and there are. There are. I mean, you need to hope that George Fant's 2020 season wasn't a a, 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 a flash in the pan and that that was a sign of things to come and he's going to build on it. you got to hope that Makai Becton bounces back with the Jets do and he's motivated and he stays in shape and he stays on the field and he plays at a Pro Bowl level. But if you have those two things, if those two things happen, you have what Joe Douglas described as arguably the best offensive guard combination in the NFL in Lakin Tomlinson and Elijah Vera Tucker. You have Connor McGovern coming off a pro football focus rated career year. So you have now created this situation where you've got not one but two running backs. Not one or two, but three and four receivers. Not one tight end, but three tight ends. Not an offensive line that has holes that is going to be a detriment to the development of your young quarterback, but one that is legitimately can be good to great, depending on the development of those offensive tackles. We stressed and ripped and grinded Joe Douglas and this off this Jets regime, not, not even this Jets regime, but also Mike McAgnan and then what bled over into, into Joe Douglas for how much they failed Sam Darnold, and they did. They failed Sam Darnold as much as Sam Darnold failed with the Jets because that you could never, and this is a point of my column last night, you could never evaluate truly Sam Darnold with the Jets because you didn't know if he stunk because Sam Darnold stunk. Spoiler alert, we have figured out that Sam Darnold does in fact stink, but you did not know if he was stinking with the Jets because he was a bad football player who could not play football or because the Jets never gave him competent coaching because the Jets never gave him somebody who could develop him or because the Jets never surrounded him with talent. It was not long ago that I was covering a Jets offense that was led by Deontay Burnett, Jermaine Cor- Jermaine Curse, and the corpse of Matt Forte. I was covering that offense. We were writing stories about is Deontay Burnett the answer in the slot? Why isn't Deontay Burnett getting more options? Sam Darnold was throwing fade route touchdowns to Andre Roberts. That's where we were five years ago, four years ago. Like within striking distance, that's where we were. And we are now talking about an offense that is Brees Hall and Mike Carter at running back. Corey Davis, Elijah Moore, Garrett Wilson, Braxton Berrios at receiver. CJ and Conklin at tight end with Rucker developing behind them and an offensive line that is competent with the potential to develop into great. Like that is just, you hat tip yourself to Joe Douglas. And I know obviously like the guys who was talking about, they're like, whoa, 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 straight. You know, they're young. We got to develop these guys. We have to develop and you're right. Like it has to develop. And at the end of the day, they are only going to go as far as Zach Wilson takes them. But the jets have finally created an environment where if Zach Wilson fails, If Zach Wilson struggles, if Zach Wilson is not a franchise quarterback, it's not because of Joe Douglas. It's not because of the coaching staff. The Jets have created an environment for a young quarterback to thrive. Now it is on Zach Wilson to thrive. And now, obviously, after that rant and roll that I didn't expect to go on, we can talk about Brees Hall if you want. Uh, Let's talk about Brees Hall, but let me play devil's advocate with Brees Hall to set you up too. Um, This team, yes, they've filled a lot of holes this offseason through free agency, through the first day of this draft. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So is taking the number one running back available in this draft at number 36, 
is that the right move when you do have Michael Carter? Yes, you want to have two running backs, but you said it. You expected them to take somebody late in this draft at running back to help fill that hole. Um, were there more important things to be done at the top of the second round than get a running back? Uh, if you go by by positions of need, yes. But I think that's what just like, and again, this was something that I thought about as I was driving home last night, is I was like, man, look what frickin's changed. Because it wasn't long ago that we covered a Jets team that drafted safety safety in the first and second round of the draft. Arguably the two least... Uh, impactful positions on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, you're, 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 you can literally name about 10 positions that impact the, the, the game more than safety. And the Jets went first round, second round safety once. You know, it was year after year after year that they drafted 34 defensive ends. Like it was every year, it was a 34 defensive end interior defensive lineman. And I was driving home thinking to myself, like, man, I can't believe the Jets really went with two more playmakers on the second day of the draft with holes at safety and interior defensive line. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, like, yes, you, you can say that the Jets had a greater need at interior defensive line. And I think there might have been a chance that the kid's name's escaping me who went from first in the second round to the, the defensive lineman who went um, 33rd to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think he was in play for the Jets. I think he was there. That was probably something they were going to discuss. Um, they could have gone safety, obviously, because that, that kid from Baylor went short, uh, I think, just after the Jets pick or the next Jets pick, the kid from Baylor, who they were potentially in uh, picking one uh, oh one. They were never going to be in cont in contention for the, the safety from Penn State. Brisker, I think his like, last name was. I mean, that was another yeah. guy that could have potentially gone there. But what the Jets have done is that this is an offense driven league. And at the end of the day, the offense and Zach Wilson is going to be what keeps Robert Sala and Joe Douglas employed. It's not going to be the defense. You have to have a competent defense, but an elite level game changing defense isn't going to keep those guys employed. Safety position is not going to keep those guys employed. The interior defensive line is going to keep those guys employed. Zach Wilson and Zach Wilson's development is all that matters with the Jets. And I've said that statement a ton over the last few years. You just replaced the quarterback's name with somebody else. It was Christian Hackenberg and Christian Hackenberg's development. It was Sam Darnold and Sam Darnold's development, you know? With the current situation of what they have done in totality between 2020, 2021, and now 2022 in both free agency and the draft, the Jets have created a situation where you cannot blame the quarterback's failures on them. They have created an environment for a young quarterback to have success. They've got the receivers. They've got the running game. They've got the offensive line. They've got the tight ends. They have so many weapons at his disposal. They can both what, – how, what is the, the, what are the, the, the line that Joe Douglas said to Sam Darnold's parents, right? I promise you I'm going to protect your son. I promise you I'm going to protect your son. Well, it was the second son he's done it for, but he has <laughs> protected Zach Wilson because he's given him protection and he's given him playmakers. And now it's on the coaching staff to develop the young players because the Jets didn't go out there and spend a ton of money on proven guys. It's on the Jets to develop these young players. But if they can develop these young players, it is all on Zach Wilson because uh, uh, this is a situation now that a young quarterback would be thrilled to be in. Absolutely thrilled to be in. Now, could they have gone somewhere else other than Brees Hall? Yeah, I mean, that would probably be one of my only criticisms of this draft is that I probably would have gone offense, uh, interior defensive line or safety with one of these two second or third round picks. That's where I personally would have gone. And so I went on like normal mock drafts, you know, just picking the top interior defensive linemen available. But when I tell you, Tim, the Jets loved Brees Hall. Like they were, they view him as not only a perfect fit in Mike LaFleur's offense, but they view this guy as like a home run hitting game changer. Like that is what this guy is. I mean, they're looking at him not as, not as, oh, you drafted a running back in the second round. They think this guy's like 1,200, 1,300 yards a year. I mean, they think that he is just a dynamic, dynamic running back. They love his vision. They love his explosiveness. They love his speed. A sub four, uh, I'm sorry, ran sub four four. Um, they love the touchdowns. They love the production. They love what the marriage of him and Mike Carter is going to do. I mean, if you think about, you start playing the game of how you know how our team's going to stack up. You have Mike Carter and this kid at running back, right? This kid gets going, and he's what the Jets think you're going to want to stack the box. You're going to want to put that extra safety in the box to stop the run. Well, you can't really put that extra safety in the box to stop the run because you got to deal with Corey Davis, Elijah Moore, and Garrett Wilson outside. But then you play coverage to stop Corey Davis, Elijah Moore, and Garrett Wilson, and now you've got Brees Hall and um, Michael Carter 
running against a, a basically an empty box up front. It's just, look, could they have gone elsewhere? Sure. But the Jets love this kid. And they had conviction on this kid. And they believed in this kid. So much so that Mike Garofolo was the first one to report this. And Joe Douglas confirmed it last night. The Jets actually contemplated trading back into the first round after they traded back into the first round for Jermaine Johnson so that they could get Hall. Like, they wanted to trade back into the first round to get Hall. They decided to wait on that, and probably because of the whole fifth-year option and finances thing and realized they could just trade up into the second round and get him because he wasn't going to go that that early. Um, and that's what they did. They basically gave up, what, an extra fifth-round pick to move up and get a running back that it is a day-one starter. You know what I mean? Like, we talked about day-one starters for the Jets, right? We'll see if Jermaine Johnson technically is a day-one starter. He's going to have a day-one role. But they've got a new starting cornerback. They've got a new starting receiver. They've got a new starting running back. And they have a defensive lineman who's going to play 60% of the snaps come week one. You know what I mean? I don't know if he's going to be on the field for the first play, but he's going to play 60% of the snaps as a rusher and run the stuffer. That is a hell of a defensive haul. And we still got two more picks here in the fourth round. So hat tip to Joe Douglas. Good. Kudos to Joe Douglas. Well, again, it all is pre- it's all predicated on these kids developing. But the one thing that we have ripped the Jets mercifully for, ripped them mercifully for, is how they failed in their development of Sam Darnold. And Joe Douglas promised he would not make that same mistake again. I was like, all right, yeah, sure, we'll see. <laughs> looking at this roster and playing the game because it's been a slow grind. It's not like it was one off season where the Jets just, you know, drafted four receivers and, and gave, you know, $200 million in free agency, right? It has been what Joe Douglas told Christopher Johnson when he looked him in the eyes before he signed that six year contract. It's going to take time. But if we do this the right way, it's going to be worth it. And when you look at what the offense looks like now, there is not a single starter from the 2019 season, which was three years ago. Not right, 20, 21, 22. Three years ago, 2019 season, there is not a single starter remaining from that team. The Jets have, back then, it was Le'Veon Bell and Bilal Powell. It's Mike Carter and Brees Hall now. Those receivers in 2019 were Demarius Thomas, Robbie Anderson, and Quincy Anunwa before he got hurt. It's now Garrett Wilson, Corey Davis, and Elijah Moore. I think Ryan Griffin and Chris Herndon were the tight ends. You've now got CJ and Conklin, and you've got a kid in Ruckert who the Jets love as a developmental project. And you remember what that offensive line looked like. There was they were picking Khalil, uh, what's it, uh, Ryan Khalil, out of the out of a retirement home. Yeah, pulled him out of retirement. Center yeah. for them. Out of, they found their week one center in a retirement home. And now you've got a legitimate offensive line that can impose their will, assuming those two tackles come along. And again, you, yeah, I, I am I, I'm on the record, and I agree. I am worried about the tackle position. But if the Jets grab depth here, because there's two really interesting names here in the third round that they can grab for the, th- the tackle position, if they can do that, again, man, just a hat tip. Because it's we've reached the point now. We have finally reached the point where you can't blame the supporting cast for the quarterback's failures. You can't say, well, Zach Wilson doesn't have blank. Well, Zach Wilson doesn't have this. Well, Zach Wilson doesn't have that. Because Zach Wilson has a hell of a lot more right now than a lot of people around the league. I would take the Jets supporting cast, and this is a hand-to-God true statement. I would take the Jets supporting cast for Zach Wilson over what the Packers have in Green Bay for Aaron Rodgers. I do. I would take Yeah, with Adams leaving. I would take it. And I'm looping in the receivers. I'm looping in the tight ends. I'm looping in the running backs. I would take the Jets supporting cast over the Packers supporting cast. Now it's on Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson, the time is yours because now it is on you to develop, to grow, to take that next step. Because if he takes that next step, if he is better this year, he doesn't have to be great. He doesn't have to be incredible. He doesn't have to be a franchise quarterback. But if he takes a legitimate step forward, if we can say at the end of year two, Zach Wilson's good, we think Zach, at the minimum, we think Zach Wilson can play. Forget if he's going to be great, elite, whatever, if he's going to be Pat Mahomes or Alex Smith. If he is a baseline of like, this guy is good. Like we, you know, he, you can, you can, he's a starting NFL quarterback, good, bad, and different Baker Mayfield, not Baker. Mayfield. Well, as long as he is a, a starting quarterback, you can say he is a starting quarterback at the end of this year. You're talking about a jets offense that has the potential and no, you don't, this isn't sleep deprivation. You don't have to have me tested for drugs. You don't have to have me a, a, a put in any mental hospital. The jets have the makings to be one of the best offenses in the NFL. If Zach Wilson takes that step. Now yeah. it's just on Zach Wilson to do it. Because the playmakers are there, the talent is there, the coaching is there. Now you just need the quarterback to take that step. All right, exciting times. We're going to talk about day three. We're also going to talk a little bit more about Jeremy Rucker after this break.
We're all trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. And it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed or, hey, right before the Jets make their pick in the NFL draft. There's never a bad time for Magic Spoons. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. Build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry, cinnamon, plus the newly reformulated honey nut flavor that will now be added to Magic Spoon's permanent collection. Honey nut does have one gram of sugar. Go to magicspoon.com slash wait to grab a custom bundle of cereal and be sure to use our promo code wait at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in the product. It's back with 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash wait. Use the code wait to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Look, we all know that change doesn't happen without action. Whether you're looking for gains in the gym or split times at the track, there's never any shame in showing up for yourself and your health. So if you're dealing with hair loss, don't ignore the issue. Instead, face it head on with Roman. Roman offers a discreet process from start to finish. You want to face the problem, but there's no need to advertise it. Prescription and over-the-counter treatments are both available. Plus, they offer fast, free shipping. You don't have to wait to start fighting that hair loss. Science-backed treatments that are proven to help slow or stop hair loss, and in some cases, even regrow hair. Get more confidence from the top down be your best self. Go to GetRoman.com slash wait today. If approved, you can treat your hair loss for as low as $20 a month. That's GetRoman.com slash wait. All right, let's move on with the other pick in the draft. Looking back on the first four picks, though, so impressive that they got their number one ranked corner, number one ranked receiver, number one ranked running back, and a guy in, in Johnson who they had ranked in their top eight overall, although not number one. Amazing stuff. And then Tight end was something we knew they had to get. They they helped the tight end position during free agency, no doubt. But you needed to get somebody for the future. And they look no further, Connor, than Long Island to get the local kid. Yeah. Of course, he went to Ohio State, Jeremy Rucker, and starred there. Uh, but it all goes back to this. This was Jeremy Rucker as a little guy growing up on Long Island. Uh, his dad actually sent this picture to uh, our Dane Brugler. Um, back when Dane was talking about Rucker possibly going to the Jets. So <laughs> there it is. He is a fan of the team, and now he joins them. 6'5", he's big. So at Ohio State, he didn't have a bit, lot of catching numbers because look at the receiving core, right? I mean, there were yeah. bigger weapons on that team, and they always have that. So he did more blocking. But what do the Jets see him as? Well, they love it. I mean, they they are uh, one of the guys I was talking to last night about it said that never in a million billion years did they think that they were going to be able to get Ruckert. You know, it was just some of the other needs on their board, some of the other needs that they had to go with, some of the other needs they thought they were going. And then when they traded those second round picks and weren't picking, you know, they picked what was it, uh, 38 or they traded up to 34 or wherever they pick Hall, but they traded up to get that pick. Yeah. And then that gave them basically only to the 101st pick. So it was, you know, 70 something selections before they picked again. Basically, they gave up the dream. <laughs> the person I was talking to gave up the dream of them having Ruckert, right? Like they just like they gave it up. And then when he was still there at 101 and they were able to turn their draft card in with him, they think that this kid has legitimate starting top tier tight end potential. And and I remember talking to Ron Middleton and we talked to Ron Mill, not just me. Uh, at the senior bowl about Ruckert. And I said, I was like, you know, he doesn't really have that much college production. Like, what do you guys see in him? And this was one of those very interesting, fascinating prospects because it he was a player. He is a player who is believed to be a significantly better professional player than college player. You know, his lack of production in college at Ohio state, it wasn't because Ruckert couldn't play. It was because Ohio State's offense does not feature the tight end in the passing game. So they use him occasionally, which is why he caught like 26 passes, for 300 yards and three touchdowns. But he's a blocker. He's an extension of the run game. That's how that offense works. And unfortunately, at the expense of 
Ruckert, it came at his usage when he could have been one of the top tight ends in the country. But the Jets got a chance to see him in those early practices at the Senior Bowl. They got a chance to see him in the meeting room. They got a chance to meet him. They got a chance to watch his film, talk to his coaches. And they look at this guy as a starting NFL tight end, as a guy who can be the seven, 800 yard a year uh, tight end, the guy who can catch 10, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 touchdowns a year. Now, the thing is, is that it's going to take time to develop him a little bit. You know, you're not just getting Ruckert and saying like, okay, boom, he's our starting tight end. He's going to push CJ for time. He's going to push Conklin for time. That's not necessarily the case, right? Like the Jets do need to refine his blocking. Just read the scouting report. And I confirm this with the Jets, but you can read Dane's scouting report. It's basically spot on with this kid. They're going to need to refine his blocking. Like he needs to get more technically sound blocking. They're going to need significantly to uh, expand his route tree because right now he really isn't doing too much, right? Like it's it's just one of those things. But if they re- if they and he's a, a hardworking, clearly kids from Long Island, he's a hardworking Long Island kid. He's going to put the effort in to refine the technique of his blocking. And when you add to his route tree, you have an athletic, fast, big tough bulldog as Joe as uh, Robert Sala described him last night just tough SOB that's going to be out there at tight end and remember if I'm not mistaken Conklin's on I think a one-year contract with the Jets and there's some outs in, in CJ's contract as well where like these guys aren't like oh the Jets just got Travis Kelsey out here or the Jets just got George Kittle out here I mean that's not what the Jets, tight end positions hell of a lot better there's a lot of talent there but it would not surprise me in two years three years if we're talking about record is this team's unquestioned starting tight end. I mean, you don't draft a kid in the third round is, you know, you're not taking slap dicks in the third round, basically, you know, you're not, you're not going out there just like wasting and burning third round selections. That's a legitimate fourth round. The Jets there. still do that in the fourth round. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's backup, right. Yeah, that's backup right. quarterbacks, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's where you draft your, your James Morgans and, uh, and uh, everything else that they usually tend to find there. Um, but no, like, like this is where like the Jets will go out there and get a look the, they believe in him a lot. They love his size. They love his athleticism. They love his speed. They love everything about this kid. Now it's just about putting the time in and developing. And Rod Mendelman's one of the best tight end coaches in the NFL. He's going to do it. Mike LaFleur, the offensive coordinator, he's going to do it. He does not, Rucker, he's not forced to play right away. Like he's not forced to go out there and do this right away. So you're going to have a situation where he can take the time to develop. He can take the time to move on. He can take the time to get better and improve and eventually become this team's starting tight end. But the jets are absolutely loving, loving, loving the fact that he was there for them in the third round at one one and they were able to get him. All right. Quick look ahead to day number three. I know you actually have to head out to the facility very soon. Yeah. Connor. Right, yeah. Um, they have two picks as of now. <laughs> Unfortunately, you'd love to see them get, a lineman on the offensive side, an interior defensive lineman, and a safety, but they would have to make some moves to do that. But who do you think they target? Because both of these picks come early. They're both in the fourth round, oh, so yeah. there's going to be talent there. Who do they target? And yeah, do you for- think they maybe trade one of them to get to no, fall I back don't. a little? That's no. the best part about okay. this is talking to Joe Douglas yesterday. Like I think they're actually just going to use these two picks and then be done. Like I don't think they're going to wheel and deal to get like extra fives and stuff. I think like, the amazing point- that they'd end up with kind of a small draft class considering yeah. how many picks they came in with. Well, that's, that's what, what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So Joe said that yesterday when we were talking to him is he said, he said, he goes the kind of the goal of this draft. Cause cause said that to him, like, Hey, you've had a bunch of holes. You've always been about recouping extra draft capital. You kind of pissed. You've traded them all away. And uh, actually let me tweet this thing out real quick. Um, we were talking about that and, and Kaz was like, you know, are you surprised that like you've you've gotten rid of him? And do you want to recoup extra picks? And and Joe basically said, like, uh, not really, because the goal this year was get the players we want. Don't worry about the the you know having the it's you know it's it's qu- uh, quality over quantity right like don't worry about just using all the draft picks use your draft picks to get the players that you want so that's why you've seen him move up and down and things of that nature but um I would be slightly surprised if they trade back partially though, because I, I told Joe that if he allows us to literally just have two fourth round picks and then chill for the next two rounds, like I'll be writing extension columns. <laughs> um, like literally like I can go Owen 16 and between the crab le- or the crab claws that they gave us last night, shrimp cocktail, and then, you know, letting us out of here after the fourth round, I would be, uh, there would be extension columns, but uh, no, like I, I think the jets are going to use these two fourth round picks and then probably be done for the draft. And some names to watch Darian Kennard, the offensive tackle guard from Kentucky. I really liked him. Uh, Daniel Falal from the offensive tackle from Minnesota. I think those two guys are really in contention with one of those two picks. Um, 
the kid from from Minnesota is more of like a true no doubt offensive tackle. He's huge, six six or six eight. I'm sorry, three hundred eighty four pounds. Still pretty athletic. Uh, our Dane Brugel actually believed he could compete for a starting job in year one. So uh, I think that's probably a very interesting p- position that the Jets could go with when Kennard's more of like a hybrid tackle guard where you want to start him at right tackle, but you might have to kick inside. So I don't know if he's necessarily the option. Uh, Winfrey, the defensive tackle from Oklahoma, he's someone to keep an eye on. Ridgeway, the defensive tackle from Arkansas. And then my like low key, like maybe there's a possibility here is the punt guy out of San Diego State. I would love to see the Jets go and get that guy. Just I know that they drafted Braden Mann, so maybe uh, Douglas isn't willing to give up on him yet. But to, to just go out when you got it, like I, I wrote this yesterday, when you've got a chance to draft someone nicknamed the punt god, you <laughs> goddamn do it. You goddamn do it. You draft the punt god. So uh, I would keep an I would keep an eye on interior defensive linemen, the guys that I made those two tackles, and then maybe maybe we get the punt guy drafted. All right, it's going to be fun. Day three, a couple more picks, maybe for the Jets, maybe more. We'll see. Uh, we're going to have a full recap of this draft coming up at some point on Monday. It'll probably be up on Apple and everything by by Tuesday morning. So take a look out for that. And uh, I think for that one, Marissa may be back with us, back from Vegas, unless she won too much money. Uh, but it'll be good to have her producing again, so I don't have to press all these buttons. Uh, but th- that'll do it for this episode. If you want to join the Athletic, you can do it for one dollar a month for six months. Go to theathletic.com/slash can't wait. Connor, safe driving back up the pike, and we'll yeah. talk to you again soon.